The big woman. When Holly and I first met in college, we clicked right away, and we decided not to wait to be married. We didn't play it up, but our closest friends were there. Our scholarship allowed us to celebrate as stylishly as possible on campus. True enough, we had both been orphaned when we were young, and by good fortune, we had not been placed in foster care. We grew up in an orphanage as a result. However, as time passed, we discovered our soulmates and made the decision to stay together. As the years passed, initially it was difficult. Following our time in college, we both started full-time jobs. There were occasionally some brief part-time occupations. We made an effort to find time for one another, albeit concurrently. Holly was fortunate to land another job at a major company a few years later. I kept working in a morgue as an assistant. We eventually saved up enough cash to purchase a modest but comfortable home with a sizable yard and a few outbuildings. In our free time, we attempted to make it into our nest, a place where we could escape the struggles of everyday life. Holly approached me one day, Jack, how do you feel? We're invited to a party on set by Amanda. However, I need to have time to finish an assignment, and you have a shift. However, I want to go out and enjoy myself. It had been a while since we went out. Talk to your partner and make a switch instead. How is your project going? I gave her a smile. Okay, I'll put in a few more hours tonight. I ought to be able to attend. All right, now hurry up and do it. Her nose furrowed. This was one of her funnier looks, but I thought it was great. Okay, I'll attempt to get Stan to do it. We continued our small talk about various topics before retiring for the night. Yes, I wanted to take a break from the daily grind and experience the same sense of exhilaration as I had as a student. Well, you seem to be straying from the path you should be on for a bit. You used to put in so much effort at work. Stan was joking around. Yes, he did ridicule me in the past. I found him a little strange, but he put in a lot of work. He thus consented to trade shifts with me. I'll make it worthwhile for you, thanks. I expressed gratitude to him. He went on dissecting the body. As usual, I stayed behind to serve tools. I even considered switching careers for a little. However, I saved a lot of money on petrol because this job paid well and was close to home. When we arrived at the scheduled event on set that her buddy had organized, they were waiting for us and had already offered us drinks. Amanda took Holly over to the females right away to talk about girl issues, and because I didn't know many people here, I started to wander around. With obvious signs of intoxication, one of the guys approached me and invited me to join the group, where the others were already seated by the swimming pool, consuming beer and lighting up a hookah. This thought didn't sit well with me. I chose to turn down the offer because I don't usually smoke normal cigarettes. Although the people in this group weren't very young, it did remind me a little bit of our college parties. It had been around 15 years ago, yet I could still remember it clearly. And shortly after, I made the decision to surrender to the delicious feelings of downing a couple beers. Holly came back to me after talking with her companions. Now that I was feeling better, I made the decision to get into trouble with her just like I used to when I was younger. Put an end to it. How are you spending your time? When I felt under her dress, she looked a little embarrassed. There are others present besides us. What now? You're my spouse. Just have fun, please. Is it not what you desired? Even after giving her a kiss, I made the decision to follow some social graces. The party did not feature wild dancing, but rather a more laid-back vibe that quickly made us forget about time and reality. And as we continued, the hops became more and more ingrained in our veins, causing our blood to beat in time with the music. Holly would vanish for what seemed like an age after we joined the other couples and they would share something with us. But my fear vanished the moment she returned to me and I felt her in my arms once more. I hardly recall our homecoming. I was so sick with a headache in the morning that I had to crawl into the refrigerator to get a can of beer or at least a cold bottle of mineral water. I had the worst time with you last night. My spouse's voice could be heard across the kitchen. Yes, tell me about it. My headache was so bad. I was grabbing the back of my skull nonstop. Are you forgetting? Jack and you had a drinking contest, and you came out on top. His endurance is well known. I doubted anyone could defeat him. She gave a small laugh. I cannot recall a single thing. Probably a bad idea for me to do that. Such a repulsive state these days. The good news is that Holly and I don't have any obligations today. I had plenty of time to get ready since my shift wasn't until tomorrow morning. However, I was lying on the sofa for the majority of the first half of the day because the rhythm from yesterday was still hammering in my temple, albeit much more so now. Holly made the decision to take a break after lunch. She left on her own after I told her no. I switched on the television to see the news. An incident that happened on Main Street yesterday is being looked into by the police. Interviewee witnesses never provided accurate information. However, some evidence points to the man knowing the victim from Main Street. That's where last night's party took place. However, I can't recall ever witnessing someone fight with anyone. I made a gradual effort to recall what had happened the previous evening but no matter how much I strained my memory, the image remained blurry, exacerbating my headache. I told Holly what I had seen on TV when she got back. However, she simply shrugged and said that, whatever he was, she felt bad for him. 
She carried a bag from the supermarket with her, so obviously, and headed for the kitchen, where I could hear her starting to prepare dinner. I remained in bed, at this point, I wasn't even hungry. However, the mineral water I had discovered earlier in the day was starting to work, and I gradually started to feel better. Stan welcomed me to work the following day with his typical sense of humor. Within, today we have a celebrity. Did you notice the news? That is, the protagonist entered. I entered and examined the lifeless body resting on the coal iron table by myself. His neck was ripped open, his chest scraped, and the corks had already turned purple. Upon closer inspection, his face looked familiar. Yes, at the party, I think I saw him there. Though I could only recall the beginning of the events that evening, I hesitated to break the news right away when the thought crossed my mind. Unintentionally, the terrifying idea that I could have been the one to do it entered my mind. Holly had been staring at me like she was trying to tell me something during the entire day. Even after we had been completing our routine tasks on the corpse for a while, the disgusting notion never left my head. I believe a heel was used to stab him in the neck. He started to wrap up. Yes, yes, it is correct. Take a look at how he was chopped. It seems that whoever did it was quite angry with him. I ignored it, not really wanting to look at it, and continued working. Stan would soon be done, and I could tidy up my desk. That night's memories flooded back to me. I recalled that Holly had temporarily disappeared somewhere. But no, what was going through my mind? She most certainly couldn't be the culprit. Just as I was going to take a break from it all at home after work, there came a tap on the door. There was a policeman on the doorstep when I opened it. He wanted to come in and ask some questions after making a courteous introduction. We had also attended the party, so he felt obligated to ask around and gather some information from those who had attended. I was really honest when I said that I didn't recall everything since I had consumed too much alcohol. Ollie entered the room at that very time, and the officer turned to face her. You have to be Mrs. I have some questions for you. Officer, I heard what you were saying. She became quite perplexed. However, I don't believe there is much I can do to help. The officer produced a photo of a man where his facial features were clearly visible. Examining it, I speculated that I might have seen him there. However, I couldn't be certain because I didn't know anyone. Holly looked nervous to me when she took up the image. Indeed, it's one of Mary's friends. Together, they attended the celebration. Yes, however, I believe they got into a brawl. Yes, you are correct. However, they didn't stay long. Indeed, it is true. Is it all you have to say? The policeman gave us both a strange look. Okay, then I'll give you my phone number. I've got the case. Give me a call if you have any memories. I took the small card he offered out and turned to face Holly. I briefly believed she was withholding something from me. But the policeman may have spotted it too, if I did. Holly sat on the couch, staring at us as we walked him out. Do you have anything you would want to tell me? I inquired. She wrapped a strand of her hair around her finger and gave me a meaningful glance as well. That was what she always did when she was anxious. That night, they just got into a huge argument. While I was with them, I witnessed them fighting before they departed. It's odd that she held off on telling me straight immediately. I did ask her, after all, is this secret at all? They argued as a result. It is not a major concern. Holly, though, was behaving a little weird that evening. I made multiple attempts to speak with her about it. However, it seemed as though she had committed the identical sentence to memory. I went to bed after deciding to leave her alone. A few days passed. We carried on living our lives normally. Although Holly had returned to her customary demeanor, I occasionally noticed her sitting attentively, as though she was trying to recall something. Given their frequent arguments, I assume Mary was the one who had worked on her lover. I had presented Holly with my version of events previously, but she disagreed. I spoke with her, and the cops as well. She wasn't the one. I believe he has just started dating some homeless women. Though you are unaware of him, he was a true womanizer. Do you believe a worker killed him? I grinned. However, everything is conceivable. I advised her to give that option to the cops. Holly, though, declined. She insisted repeatedly that it was not our concern. Perhaps it is. However, it was also my family's company. Furthermore, I wanted everyone to know how certain we were. A couple more days passed. Stan was well acquainted with the cops, and from them he obtained some valuable information. He informed me that there was insufficient evidence to solve the case. We everyone forgot about the incident quite quickly. It was Holly's birthday soon. I booked a table at the restaurant in anticipation of surprising her. She got dressed up in her go-to attire. Her boyfriend, with whom she never broke up, and her friend Amanda were also invited. It was very cozy for the four of us to sit in the booth by the counter. The two of them were there when Holly and I got there. As usual, Amanda greeted us with a warm embrace. Holly, you look amazing. She grinned. Oh, why aren't you donning your most cherished footwear? These look fantastic with this dress. That would only be noticed by a lady. I gave it a close look and combed my memory, and sure enough, it has been a long time since I last saw those dark blue patent leather heels. A coincidence is not possible. Whoa, the heel cracked. I'm unable to have it fixed. Holly interrupted my conjecture. We kept having fun for several hours until we could all clearly tell we were becoming sleepy, at which point we left to head home. I made the decision not to ruin the evening with my worst guesses. 
Ollie grinned with her sleepy eyes and stretched so fiercely that I decided to postpone asking her about her shoes until the next morning. Considering that it was her birthday, I didn't want to ruin it, but I completely forgot about it when I woke up. As usual, I ran to work. However, a police call there caused me to reconsider my suspicions. The responding officer informed us that we needed to report to the station since there was new information regarding the case's night. After inquiring if it would hold off until the end of the day, I met my wife at home with additional information after receiving a positive response. How? What were they able to discover? Once more, it appeared to me that Holly had something to hide. In response, I said that I had no idea. Holly headed to her closet. Lost in thought, I waited for her downstairs. The sound of a text message on Holly's phone, which she had inadvertently left on the table, averted my attention. After giving it a quick scan and deciding it seemed urgent, the screen went black once more, so I decided to find out if it was truly that vital. Attempting to get the final message, I swiped the screen and noticed a video message at the bottom with the words take a look. It's crucial. Abruptly, my curiosity got the better of me, and I clicked on the video. I found it difficult to look away from the film, more out of shock than curiosity. Holly was clearly having fun with some males in the video. I had eyes I couldn't believe. God, I'm so sorry. Holly's cry brought me back to the present. Avoid watching that. It is untrue. It's simply a joke, nothing more. I suppose it's a montage. She immediately began to offer explanations. I was perplexed and unsure of where to begin. But I quickly started asking Holly questions of my own. She pretended to be the victim of someone else's practical prank for a while while she denied it. Our discussion quickly descended into controversy. She finally acknowledged that it was indeed her when I persisted in pressing her. She began screaming at me, saying that I had to pay for bills and other expenses because I didn't earn enough money. She chose to moonlight because, having been reduced, her pay wasn't all that different from mine. I could feel my rage swelling inside of me. I felt like I was about to blow up. I slapped her across the face and began to swear at her. Subsequently, I interrogated her about her knowledge of that case while holding her down with one hand on the couch. She acknowledged that the man had discovered her part-time work, recorded it using his phone, sent her the footage, and threatened to blackmail her. However, she got into a fight with him during the party and repeatedly struck him in the neck with a stiletto because she could no longer stand his quiet. Holly insisted she didn't want it to end, but I stopped caring. Blood and grime suddenly covered my lovely environment. Holly was not the same lady I loved anymore. Something sparked in me, like though the same shark heel had torn apart my emotions. Nothing went as planned when we went to the police station. Rather of waiting for us, the officer personally visited our home. He saw us in our state and recognized right away that something was not right. Holly begged me not to say anything as she gave me a tearful expression. However, she had put an end to my feelings for her. Though it would have seemed unfeasible to alter her emotions in such a profound way, that is precisely what happened. I showed the policeman Holly's phone and told him all I had discovered. And the next thing she knew, he was handcuffing her and escorting her to the squad car outside the house. Story 2 Here's another thrilling tale for you to peruse. It was a calm Friday night. After finishing all the housekeeping, Irina settled into the sofa. She flipped on the radio. Anatoly, her husband, was preparing to broadcast a show. Irina closed her eyes, straightened her leg, and rested. She started to reflect on tonight. Calmly, it's nice to be a housewife, she thought. She recollected the small things, doing housework, preparing meals, and going shopping. She refused to work despite Anatoly's constant advice to do so. Sweetheart, unlike you, I only have a high school diploma, I have never attended a university. Anatoly remained silent, rolling his eyes. Even though he knew that arguments were pointless, he yet enjoyed occasionally upsetting his wife. Irina was no longer considering arguments, though. As she was tuning into the radio, Anatoly's voice finally reached her. At first, he hosted a variety of radio shows since he couldn't decide which one best fit him. He was then asked to deliver the news. He did have a timetable, but from that point on he began working erratically. He might leave early for work in the morning, return in the afternoon, and then report back to work in the evening to provide the evening news. In the evenings, he might visit the studio and labor there until the stroke of midnight. There were occasions when he would dub the news from dawn until night. Though occasionally he would not, Anatoly would usually return home in a positive attitude. Anger fits, but only when Anatoly was bullied by a foolish supervisor or some subpar co-workers. He worked silently through the evening news that day before heading back home. The atmosphere was positive. Anatoly had nobody to annoy him that day. He said, hello, Irina, and left for dinner. His wife said, hello, what kind of day did you have? Not much, just your normal routine. Without me, how are things going at home? All right, too. How was your workout at the gym? Today is not a workout day for me. Mondays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays are when I work out. Yes, you're correct, I forgot. I apologize, for some reason, Anatol felt uneasy. Yes, his wife said, it does happen. That day, Anatole went straight to bed after dinner. Tomorrow, at two in the morning, I have to work, so I have to get enough sleep. He complained remorsefully, I have an idiotic schedule. 
Narina added, and I have to train tomorrow. In the morning, I also have to train. It's much simpler for you. That defies argumentation. Let's head to bed, please. Yes. Everything went off without a hitch the following day. His wife was the only one who arrived home and announced, Darling, the trainer told me I have to go to training six times a week going forward. Why? Anatoly became a little irritated with him because he could not comprehend. The coach advised me to exercise more frequently because of my health. Will he turn you into an Olympic champion? Excited with his wife's activities, Anatoly attempted to brush it off as a joke. Or rather, her coach, not even his wife. Giggling, Irina remarked, Oh, what an Olympic champion. Only to improve one's health. Yes, for greater health, I understand. All right, let's get started. Let's assume I think so. It's beyond me. Marina became enraged. Are you assuming anything about me? Why do you feel like this? Relax. Again, let me reiterate. All right, so I think it. Then we'll find out. Say what? Irina hummed. Yes, it is correct. Thus, from Monday to Saturday, Anatoly worked, Irina went to the gym, and so on. They were both exhausted when they got home. Furthermore, neither of them seemed especially keen to discuss anything. Anatoly convinced himself that Irina was merely working out at the gym and that everything was okay. Irina, going out, and not having affairs with other men. Irina was, well, Irina. But Anatoly's forbearance was short-lived, just one week. Eventually, on Saturday, he reached his breaking point. What do you do there so much? He inquired. And the odd thing was that his spouse became combative. Why don't you trust me? She yelled. We use the simulators to exercise. However, you're not aware of that. In the studio, you're always on your ass. Please relax, you moron. Who covers the cost of your gym visits? And to blame. So stop talking before I ban you from exercising altogether. Actually, find employment. Our family will find things much easier as a result. Well, I apologize for my overreaction. It is accurate. Why are you over there, then? Anatoly followed along. He was curious to learn. A complete reality. You know, I've read online that working out daily isn't the greatest idea and will actually be detrimental to your health. With a mischievous smirk, Irina remarked, My trainer, Max, is very skilled at what he does. Okay, all right, I do believe you. To get his wife to quit fighting, he stated this. However, he started to doubt his wife even more. The thing that irritated Anatoly the most was that, because Irina had a training session on Monday, he had to stay up late tonight and for the next two days to check on his wife. The time passed slowly. Anatoly was anxious because he was apprehensive about learning. The awful truth, followed by rage at his spouse and the gym coach, and then the realization that it was. All these baseless suspicions, and then scolding himself for being such an idiot. However, time passed, and Tuesday eventually arrived. Subsequently, Anatoly was in for a bomber. His wife led the way to the gym, so he cautiously followed her outside. Anatoly waited for Irina in a shadowy corner, thinking, I don't think it's all for nothing. Beneath a dense pine tree, since the training was taking place in the morning, the surrounding environment was already getting heated by the strong sun. It was starting to feel stuffy. Despite his heavy breathing and perspiration, Anatoly continued to wait for Irina. It turned out that he had not been waiting for her in vain. His spouse soon emerged and said, Why is there a bald man on the gymnasium's low porch? He looked around, his lengthy face displaying a full black mustache. Irina was escorted somewhere by the man who approached her and took her under his arm. Anatoly went unnoticed by Irina and the coach. Anatoly trailed after them. A pair guided him into the dense underbrush in the rear of Central Park. Right here. After pulling out his phone, the coach placed a call. So, Max, did you make a taxi call? Anatoly heard the query from his spouse. The man said, I did. In a minute, the automobile will arrive. Therefore, Max, Anatoly reasoned, the last name is most likely Bornsky. Thus, my misgivings were not unwarranted. Anatoly remained optimistic. He realized that it would happen eventually. His wife would never even find a job. She was too eager to go to that gym. It's better if she is cheating on me because then I have a reason to file for divorce. Anatoly now recognized that he had always desired a divorce from Irina. So why are you suddenly upset with this Max as well as Irina? Like someone inquired from outside. The truth wasn't withheld by Anatoly. There was nothing you could have kept from yourself anyhow. Hey, idea. Irina is still my love, maybe that's why. That's the reason I'm hesitant to file for divorce. But that didn't matter anymore if he loved Irina or not. As it appears that she has finally made the decision to deceive Anatoly by using her trainer. It was just a matter of being absolutely positive that it was dishonest. Thus, Anatoly used the app to make a cab call as well, and the automobile was right on Irina's tail. Max then departed. Anatoly directed the driver to follow that taxi over there. I let a little cash on top. Indeed, sir, the driver answered. This time, Anatoly followed the path to a modest, three-story home that had been tastefully renovated and furnished. Max and Irina got out of the taxi at this point. Anatoly stopped behind the dumpster and inquired. The cabbie came to a stop. After paying the driver and getting out of the car, Anatoly started to consider his options. He didn't have to consider for very long, though. Max, it found out, was a ground-level resident. 
floor, he observed the intruder via the apartment window. The bedroom was right outside of it. Irina followed Max into the bedroom. Max then hurled Irina into the bed and began taking her clothes off. Irina had to have wanted him to, too. She gave her eyeballs a squeeze. Anatoly couldn't take it anymore and knocked on the window, shutting and grinning. Max and Irina gave a start. Max released her, moved to the window, opened it, and Anatoly punched him in the face. Coach is filthy. Anatoly yelled. Max said, you sob, and got up to leave. He soon emerged into the yard with a tire iron. Using the crowbar, he struck Anatoly in the ribs and then the legs. When, soon, Anatoly stumbled and squatted in agony as the coach repeatedly struck his nose with a boot. What followed Anatoly could not recall. In the hospital, he was awakened. Beside the nurse, there were two investigators. One of them asked, looking as bald as Max but without a mustache. Good afternoon. May I ask how you are? Since Anatoly did not yet fully understand his condition, he did not respond to this query. He made another statement. I can now share my experience with you. That will not be required. All we've come to do is inform you that there's nothing you can do. All that was anticipated has already transpired. How about Max? A week Anatoly asked. Max ran away from you after you were defeated. While you were unconscious, we spent a week looking for him, and we eventually located him. We were eager to get our hands on him. However, we didn't. The man resisted the arrest quite a bit. Thus, the police had to apply force. That man was due for that. Anatoly let out a sigh. Come to us if you need any assistance. His business card was left by the second investigator. Right now, I want to see my spouse. To this slime, I have something to say. The detectives cast their heads down. I'm afraid that's not feasible, remarked the bald man. Why? Anatoly became restless. With a painful wrinkle of his nose, he fell silent. Yes, it seems that following your beating by Max, your wife told him some things. Thus, he ended her there in his apartment, stuck a knife in her. It shocks me. Anatoly let out a sigh. He experienced little happiness or sorrow. He did indeed love his wife, but love was out of the question once she chose to cheat on him. You see, Max had a bad temper, the bald investigator stated. A man was capable of harboring numerous grudges and then venting them on another individual. Anatoly, you were that person. That's not all, though. Max was still furious even after he had already let someone know how he felt. An erratic, and he would take a punch to the face from anyone who dared to speak to him. So he's mad, Anatoly cried out. How is he permitted to collaborate with others? The investigator with a bald head raised his hands. Unfortunately, Max never had a psychiatrist's registration. Furthermore, no abnormalities within the normal range were ever observed in him. Furthermore, Max had a violent temper. Incidentally, the administration of the gym where he worked has previously been interviewed. The fact that a crazy individual was hired as a trainer has prompted an investigation. Ultimately, it will be necessary to close the gym. Anatoly gently thanked him and settled back into the bunk. The detectives chuckled. It took Anatoly a long time to get better. Anatoly's nose broke and didn't heal correctly, which prevented him from working at the studio. He started working as a diction instructor at one of the nearby university's theater faculties. It was among his peers that he met and eventually married his wife. Anatoly had a long and fulfilling life with her. My comment, if only OP knew about their affair earlier, maybe the ending would different, maybe not. What would you have done? Story 3. An affair began to grow between me and a co-worker, despite the monotony of working at an office. Our increasing affections for one another were too strong to ignore. Our lives continued to entwine, creating a spark that finally grew into a fire between us. Our casual interactions evolved into long talks, veiled glances, and deceptive chances for intimacy. Week by week, our bond deepened, and the fact that our relationship was banned just made us more attracted to one another. Whenever we felt like taking a vacation from the routine of our everyday existence, our companionship brought us comfort. It was the ideal diversion from our daily routines. The lines between friendship and a deeper, more personal relationship blurred, and we both gave in to the seductive pull of passion, revealing our relationship to others turned become the binding force between us. It was a thrilling and nerve-wracking game that made me feel both excited and anxious. Our forbidden love was heightened by our physical proximity, which allowed us to meet up secretly under the pretense of work commitments and sneak about to steal kisses in secret nooks. We fooled ourselves into thinking we were unbreakable and that our secret relationship could continue discreetly inside our office. It was a nightmare the day my unfaithful partner's spouse showed up at our home to tell my husband the truth. Up until that point, I persuaded myself that my affair was real and my husband would never discover it. However, the consequences of my decisions finally came up with me, and I felt helpless under the weight of my regret and guilt. My carefully constructed existence was about to come apart because of what I had done. Like any other ordinary workday, the tragic day began in the same manner. It was Friday, and as I gave my husband a hug and a kiss goodbye, I had no idea that the facade of our perfect marriage, which I had worked so hard to build, was about to collapse. I hadn't even seen the impending storm that was quickly arriving since I had been so preoccupied with the responsibilities of my job and getting through my day. 
My spouse was using his day off to play video games on his PlayStation 5, which is one of his favorite pastimes. He had no idea that someone strange was going to walk into our life and bring with them the weight of a revelation that would turn everything upside down. The loud clang of the doorbell interrupted the silence in our house. My spouse was completely unaware that anything unusual was going to happen. Nevertheless, he was startled to see a woman he had never met before when he opened the door. She identified herself as the spouse of the man I was sleeping with at work. My spouse was shocked in shock as she revealed the devastating truth that had been hidden. For what seemed like an age, the weight of her words lingered in the atmosphere. She unintentionally disclosed that she and her husband had an affair. We'd been betraying one another for a long, long time. She revealed that six months earlier, she had learned of our crimes and had confronted her spouse about the affair. After their chat, she had assumed the affair was over. But all morality had been superseded by our cravings, and we had resumed our illicit relationship. She had contacted me as a last-ditch attempt to keep her marriage intact. She warned me not to get near her partner in case she told my husband everything. But my conceit and the attraction of our illicit relationship overshadowed my sense of reason, and I dismissed her threats as empty rhetoric. I told myself that there would be no negative repercussions if we carried on with our affair. The foundations of my existence began to collapse around me, though, as the truth started to come to light. My spouse, who had been blissfully ignorant of my affair with another guy, was suddenly forced to face a reality he had never anticipated. Days of incredulity and heartache followed as he made a choice that would forever change our path in life. Before leaving our shared house, he left a note requesting help from a lawyer and an Arab. He was so devastated by the betrayal that he decided to dissolve our marriage and cut all of the connections that had once united us. The filing for divorce served as further evidence of the irreparable harm I had caused. Even after the affair was revealed, my husband refused to keep it inside our marriage because he was so filled with rage and the urge for revenge. Not only had the treachery damaged my personal life, but it had also tarnished the job where the affair had started. Motivated by a combination of righteous rage and bruised pride, my husband came up with a plan to expose the affair to the same people who had unintentionally helped to make it happen. He was determined to face those who had helped with the affair, and with a voice full of purpose, he called the number of the company where I worked. But as soon as someone answered the phone, he was struck with contradictory feelings. Understanding that telling the truth would have a significant effect on the parties concerned, he experienced both anxiety and resolve. His internal turmoil grew louder as the quiet on the other end of the phone grew. Still, my husband held his composure as he broke the devastating news to the gullible people at his wife's former place of employment. He investigated the matter thoroughly, revealing the lies and deceit that had taken place at our workplace. His remarks were crystal clear, cut like jagged pieces of broken trust, with no space for doubt or misunderstanding. The effect was instantaneous, the corridors were alive with whispered exchanges and sidelong glances that mixed scorn, sympathy, and interest about the matter in question. It was not long before we realized that those who had been regarded as highly esteemed were now suffering serious harm to their careers and reputations. Our acts had immediate and significant repercussions. Not only did the disclosure of my private meeting with the other man damage my reputation, but it also had negative effects on my career, adding to my already unbearably high level of pain. The consequences of my decisions rippled through every area of my life. I was left to carry the entire weight of my sins alone as a direct and indirect consequence. Overtaken by a deep sense of helplessness and loneliness, I was left with nothing but the lingering echoes of sorrow and remorse when the man I had been involved with at work withdrew and sought solace in his own marriage. I had no choice but to accept this brutal reality as I stood amid the debris of my broken existence. The consequences of my selfish behavior were severe and included losing my husband's affection, our marriage collapsing my reputation being tarnished, and the unbearable pain caused by my affair. I was filled with regret as I saw the destruction caused by my selfish goals. The stakes were too high when I gambled with love. I paid an enormous price for what I did. I would live with the consequences of my decisions for the rest of my life, always conscious of the suffering I caused to people I cared about. In the end, the affair caused a dramatic change in the dynamics of the workplace in addition to shattering my husband and me's trust. Our acts had far-reaching effects that went well beyond our own lives. As a result, I lost significance and was left with a path littered with shattered connections. We appreciate you listening to this story. Please continue on for another thrilling tale. We lived together for six of the nearly seven years that I was in a relationship with this female. I worked as an electronic consultant, whose job it was to configure systems with a multitude of sensors. It was a lucrative job, but it required a lot of travel. This is merely to set the scene. I eventually got a feeling that things wasn't quite right. Although my intuition told me so, I was unable to identify it. Since I typically follow my intuition, I made up my mind to confirm my suspicion. I carefully placed a little sound-activated recorder in each of our condominium's rooms while she was gone. The device was really little because the storage was on my workplace computer. On a Friday afternoon, I carried out this plan, spent the weekend with her, and enjoyed myself. 
But Sunday night, I packed my car with a GPS tracker, grabbed my equipment, and drove off. She drove off the next morning, and I headed off to my next place of employment. The original schedule called for a two-week absence. I spoke with her every day for the first week, but even though it was when she usually stayed at home, during the second week she was often missing when I called. She gave me a number of justifications when I asked her about it, like helping her brother and working meetings and delayed dinners. When the two weeks were over, I went back home and straight to my office. After listening to the recordings, I discovered that there was a lot going on in the first week and very little in the second, save for a loud passing car. I decided to listen to the recordings from the first week again, and to my astonishment, I saw that she was talking to another man. To exacerbate the situation, she was speaking, so I could hear both sides of the exchange. As it happens, she had been cheating on us since the beginning of our relationship. When I realized this, I decided it was time for retribution. Finding the person she was having an affair with was my first task. I did some investigating and found that, prior to our meeting, she had worked at a campsite where she had met this guy and his wife and family. After that, I located their residence and looked through their phone records. I looked up the number since, even though this was a few years back, people still used landlines. It was great that the number was listed. When I rang the number, a man picked up. I asked to talk with Mrs. Smith in a professional manner because I was prepared for this. She answered the phone when he called for her. I asked her if she knew my soon-to-be ex-girlfriend. She said that they had invited her over to their house several times since they had first met at the campground. I was surprised to learn about that. I told her that we couldn't talk about the specifics of the situation just then, but I would give her a thorough explanation if she could get in touch with me at a time that worked for her. I gave her my cell phone number in the hopes that she would give it to me back. She got in touch with me two days later, as I had expected. When I told her everything I had taped, at first she didn't believe me. I promised her I would make a copy of the tape and send it over. She nodded, but she wasn't convinced. I went over to a neighboring recording studio with all the files and briefed them on my requirements, knowing I had my job cut out for me. They combined all the separate recordings such that the conversation was finished when she walked around the home. They then burnt these CD-quality audio recordings. Five CDs were needed to record the entire talk. I did not, however, mail these CDs to Mrs. Smith. I sent the CDs to her through registered mail and bided my time. When she got back to me after ten or so days, she looked calm and told me that she had filed for divorce the day before. For the next two weeks, her spouse was abroad on an oil rig. I had sent her some CDs, which she had listened to and given to her lawyer. The woman's husband had worked his way up to a sizable fortune over the years, which had allowed them to purchase an RV, a boat, and acres of land for camping. She insisted on getting half of it all, though. The speaker couldn't help but chuckle to themselves after hanging up. They believed the spouse deserved what was coming to him because they had heard some disgusting things on recordings. They never revealed this to the girlfriend, though, and acted normally the entire time. I chose to install a tracker on her car for the next week in spite of my reservations. Nothing noteworthy occurred, but things quickly descended into mayhem. My partner was walking about the home, seemingly lost and without purpose. She told me that a friend of hers was going through a divorce when I asked her about her behavior. BF Watch TV 2021 Despite expressing my condolences, I carried on with my day. Later that night, I saw her seated on the porch, talking on the phone with someone. Although I wasn't really listening, I did note that during the phone call, her voice was growing louder. She entered the bedroom right away once it was over. Curious, I moved to the door when I heard her shuffling around. She was stuffing luggage with clothing. She did not answer when I inquired what she was doing. When she was done packing, she went outside to her car and drove out without a word. My girlfriend didn't say anything on the radio for two weeks, so Mrs. Smith gave me an update over the phone. Her husband had received divorce papers from her, stating adultery as the reason. He naturally refuted the accusation but Mrs. Smith was able to supply precise information that put an end to his denials. She also verified that she was the one who made the phone call my girlfriend had the night before she departed. Despite Mrs. Smith's denial of speaking out, there was obviously more to the tale. My ex-girlfriend insisted nothing happened, but finally she revealed information that proved she was guilty. She seemed to be saying to my girlfriend that she had found out the truth on her own and that she would share it with me next. This realization clarified the reason behind my girlfriend's sudden departure. I thus took action, cancelling her credit card and starting the process of having her automobile repossessed. I made arrangements to have her insurance cancelled and the utilities turned off. Her father received all of the things she left behind, delivered by movers, along with a letter explaining why she had gone so abruptly. The fact that her father lived two states away added to the complexity of the matter. We lived in a condo, so I made arrangements for a sublease to be exhibited. I relocated and took up residence in a new condo in a gated community with a car shed in just four days. Her automobile was eventually picked up and taken away. Her automobile was repossessed while she was at work. Thankfully, the dealership agreed to cooperate and sell the vehicle to me for the difference. 
because he was afraid his employer would find out about his dark secrets. Mr. Smith never expected Mrs. Smith to win her divorce and get her fair share. Regarding my former partner, I never received a message from her. I want to sincerely thank all of my devoted subscribers and listeners. I am very grateful that you took the time to listen to this story. I hope you will read this next interesting story. We usually sat in his living room, me reclining on the couch with Mark's arms wrapped around me. Just then, Emmett materialized from one of the hallways, and I thought my greatest nightmare had come true. But in an instant, Mark had wrenched me from his grasp and stood up, showing me that this was, in fact, not a nightmare. When Mark realized who his friend was, he shoved me away and was punched in the face. Then Emmett turned to face me and said, Today, seeing you in the arms of my best friend, I finally got the courage to remove you from my life and the lives of my children. As Emmett stormed out of the house, I tried to follow him, but he disappeared and I was never able to find him. I knew I was about to have a catastrophe, but I wasn't prepared to deal with it all just yet. Hello, I'm Alex, and I have been dating Mark for the past two years. I was married to Amit before that, and he had two kids from a prior relationship. I got invited to this important function when Amit was abroad, but he really wanted me to go. I was the only guest at the party, so I was alone myself until Mark came up to me. Knowing that I was the closest friend he had at the party, we clicked right away. We drank a lot of booze and enjoyed each other's company while talking, laughing, and dancing the whole night. Our bond was so great that it finally led to us sharing his car's backseat. Even though we had previously crossed paths, that night's encounter was unlike any other. We made a terrible mistake in judgment that we concealed from other people because we thought it was an isolated incident. After the incident, we parted ways, vowing never to do it again. Still, I couldn't get rid of my yearning for Mark. I didn't feel guilty about betraying my spouse even when I got back home. Instead, I kept looking for reasons to see Mark. I expected to feel bad about what I did to my spouse, but at first, I didn't. I honestly talked to Emmett about Mark, even though I felt I would never be able to face my husband again. My behavior showed no signs of shame or guilt. I began meeting Mark behind my back, making up all kinds of excuses, and each time we got together, we ended up having heated conversations. Though at first we were reluctant to act in this way, eventually we learned to see it as our right to seek happiness. I was unable to resist seeing Mark even though I was happy, had a great life with Emmett, and was embraced by his kids. My body gave in to an overwhelming craving as Mark and I got intertwined. I didn't understand I was endangering my life since I was so obsessed by my desire. Since Emmett had remained staying home with his kids per their desire, it had been a month since my last interaction with Mark. But I was at my breaking point after a month of abstinence. I decided to have a meeting with Mark when the kids were at school. I made up an explanation for Emmett about our kids, telling him that I promised to get them ice cream after school. After that, I left our house and went straight to Mark's. Emmett, meantime, was by himself at home and made the decision to visit his best friend, who also showed up at his residence. He was perplexed to see my parked car outside his friend's house. I left the house in a few seconds and gave his closest friend a public kiss in front of him. Emmett showed patience by hiding so neither of us would find him after he got back in my car and drove off. I was home by the time he returned, and I was there to greet him and the kids. They talked about getting ice cream, but he disregarded us and went directly to his house office. I was unaware of the incident he had seen involving his company. As the days went by, I couldn't help but see a change in his demeanor that lasted for about a week. The more I thought about it, the more I was certain that something was wrong. I finally gathered up the confidence to tell him about it. Looking back, I saw that my own imperfections were what affected my judgment. I always had this inclination to see other people through the distorted spectacles of my own faults. Rather than approaching him with an open dialogue, I hurriedly accused him of adultery while ignoring my own shortcomings. I was surprised when he answered when he heard my charges. I had a strong impulse to get out of there as soon as I was in the same room as him, so I did just that. I stormed out. I was certain that Emmett's seeming disdain for me could only have its roots in the fact that he was seeing someone else. This conviction was so powerful that it perverted my judgment kept me from realizing that he had been waiting for the right moment to face me and make me aware of my actual worth and position. It had taken him an entire month of my adultery before he had the guts to tell me straight out, and I was left with no option but to deal with the fallout from my choices. He told us when he got to Mark's place that he knew everything and that I could do as I pleased because he had no intention of staying in this marriage. I was a little concerned for Mark's safety as I entered the home. I was shocked to hear that he had ended our relationship and that I had to leave his house right away. His abrupt statement surprised me, so I tried to talk him out of it by saying that this was the ideal chance for us to fully admit our affections for one another. Regretfully, Mark was unwavering in his determination, stating that the stigma associated with his prior affair with his best friend's wife prevented him from ever formally establishing our connection. I reminded him that he was now with me in a last-ditch effort to save our relationship, but he just could not handle the idea of being with someone who had been associated with something so scandalous in the past. When I finally got home, I was overcome with intense emotional pain. 
Mark's rejection broke my heart and scattered my spirit into a million fragments. I knocked on the door instead of trying to open the gate because I encountered unexpected opposition. Without saying anything, Ahmed answered the door and gave me two suitcases. Before he could shut the door, I stopped him, bewildered and shocked, and inquired about the contents of the bags. Ahmed informed me that I was no longer welcome in the house and that all of my stuff had been packed away, much to my complete surprise and dismay. In addition, he told me that I had to stop seeing his kids, which essentially cut off communication. This unexpected and terrible loss was almost too much to handle. The man ruthlessly threw away every single photo he had taken of Mark and me over several days. Sadly, I lost everything I held dear, including my partner, children, home, and self-respect, all because of the overwhelming power of lust. The one for whom I had been prepared to sacrifice everything has likewise abandoned me because he cannot publicly recognize our relationship. I reached out to Emmett multiple times, but he never cared to reply, which hurt my heart and made me feel unloved. Even when I visited the school where our kids were enrolled in the hopes of getting a sight of them, the instructors told me that Emmett had given them orders to stay away from me. I had come to the conclusion that I had cheated on Emmett, but it was too late. Emma won't let me contact those adorable kids, even though I've spent the last three years with them, so I can't enjoy watching them develop and thrive. This seems to be my payback for not being given the chance to own up to my sins or even offer an apology for my adultery. I am therefore left to face the world by myself, carrying the burden of my shame with me till I take my last breath. I mistakenly took all of my blessings for granted, thus this is a price I will have to pay for the rest of my life. Even though I have a lot on my plate, I have to keep going and hold out hope that one day I'll get the chance to put things right. I can only hope that, in the interim, this experience will make me more appreciative of the love and company I am fortunate to have in my life. I eventually gave up trying to get in touch with Emmett over time, realizing that my ingratitude was the main reason I was being punished. I had to swallow a bitter pill, but I had to accept my fate ultimately. Two long years later, I happened to run across Emmett, his kids, and a strange woman at a restaurant. It looked like they were having a nice evening together. I couldn't tell if this was the new woman Emmett was seeing. It just so happened that I was a waitress at the restaurant at the time. I quickly switched tables with another server and headed off to avoid any awkward meetings. Though it was a somber reminder of what I had lost, I understood that it was a result of my own doing. I want to tell everyone not to cheat on their beloved spouses, whether they are already cheating or plan to. Remain truthful and devoted. We appreciate you remaining with us. Let's go on to the last tale. Just as I took up my phone, it started ringing. I believed my fiancé was abroad on business, but a voice on the other end told me she was in bed with her business colleague before I could even say hello. The call ended abruptly, taking me by surprise. My surprise, though, was short-lived as I hurried to answer the doorbell when it rang. There was an envelope on the step, but no one was there when I opened the door. I silently mumbled Eva's name as I started to remove the tape. It wasn't funny if this was a prank of any kind. The envelope opened to reveal a distantly snapped photo of Eva and her business colleague in bed. I knew they were being spied on since I work in it. After calling Eva and getting no response, I called the number on the envelope and spoke with the surveillance officer. Notes, the person on the phone told me they were the man's wife who was in the pictures with my girlfriend when I asked them to identify themselves. It was through this startling realization that I learned Eva had dated her business partner prior to our meeting. She started seeing me with the intention of making him jealous and regret breaking up with her. I was furious to find out about her hidden agenda and how she took advantage of my love for her to exact revenge on her former partner. I took a seat and started thinking back to my initial meeting with Eva. I'm Darren, and I'm 25 years old. Eva, who is now 24 years old, and her business needed a website a year ago. I got to know her then. After seeing the website, Eva and her partner gave me their whole office lease. I've been taking care of all of their requirements ever since. Eva eventually picked up the phone when I tried to contact her once again. Eva told me she was in a meeting when I questioned her about why she hadn't been returning my calls. I ended the phone after expressing my desire for her and hearing her response. I quickly turned on my laptop and emailed her a link, which she clicked on right away. I was able to access her phone's camera when she clicked on the link. Regretfully, I wasn't interested in what I saw when I looked through the other end. Eva was laying in bed with a white sheet covering her and her phone in her hand when I spotted her through the camera on her phone. She had just told me she was in a meeting, which left me perplexed as to why she was naked in bed. This information sent my thoughts into overdrive. Her business partner suddenly materialized on television, leaning his head against her shoulder and giving her a kiss. I offered a weak explanation when she asked about the link, it was accidentally emailed to her when it was supposed to go to someone else. She didn't hesitate to accept my explanation. I was blind to the facts because of my love for her. I realized that throughout the whole duration of our relationship, I had been oblivious to her dishonesty. I decided that I would not be her plaything any longer. When she finally arrived the next day, it seemed like an eternity. Taking no time to compose myself, I went to her about her adultery. She initially denied everything, 
but when I brought up the camera hack, she sighed and admitted without showing any regret. My heart felt as though it had been torn out of my chest. I forced myself to ask her why she'd used me all along, in spite of the anguish. She admitted that she could easily make her ex-boyfriend envious of me. She didn't mean to use me at first, but she saw that he would get apprehensive any time she spoke with me. So she acted like she was in love with me, and on the day our relationship was formalized, he pleaded with her to let him back into her life. She felt bad sometimes for taking advantage of me, but she also thought it was important to maintain his interest in her. I had deep feelings of love for you at first, but since yesterday, I've been feeling angry, I told her as we talked about life. I now feel bad for you since all you had to do was pretend to love me in order to attract your ex-partner's attention. It's among the worst things that may occur to any individual. She answered that I had her permission to end our relationship if I so desired. She added that she had never loved me and had no regrets about it. At that point, I felt it was imperative, so I did it. I warned her that I would not spare her. I told her to leave my property after she had to make up for what she had done to me. She was so enamored of him that she didn't even consider how I might have learned about their relationship. I suffered for two days. But one thing was certain, I wouldn't spare her the repercussions of her deeds. She may have felt guilty about her actions, but I had already forgiven her for it. But she was so determined to set things right that it was hard for her to forgive. I thought about it for two days and came up with a plan that needed me to be in her office. I so made the decision to visit her. She asked why I was here, and I told her that I had come to get my stuff. It would only take a few minutes to switch her flash drive for mine, and I knew she had a merger meeting later that afternoon. After getting my belongings back, I was prepared to leave the workplace, but I was left feeling defeated and wondering how I would take matters into my own hands. Someone called my name and asked me to investigate a projector problem in a meeting room, but fate had other ideas. This was the kind of opportunity I had been waiting for, and now it was here. I seized the opportunity to replace the flash drive and calibrate the projector after going into the room where Eva and he were sitting. My real purpose was to watch Eva's anguish. I pretended that I needed the projector turned on in order to make sure it worked. Together with the photos I took after breaking into her camera, these were the ones that were forwarded to me. I saved the photos I shot with the compromised camera in case she refuted my charges. She denied me the chance, so I took advantage of those images to ruin her career and personal lives. Everyone in the room, including the new merger partners and their maintenance staff, started whispering to each other. Nobody was surprised that Eva and I were dating, and everyone knew that her partner was married. They immediately began to view them critically as soon as they saw them in these pictures. I came up to her and told her that at the time, I thought it was necessary. Their business partners excused themselves from the meeting, and her partner left without warning, announcing the end of their romance. I reminded her that I'd told her there would be consequences if she used me for her selfish game. Nothing is left for you now, not even the company, not the love of your life, not the one who loved you completely, so I think I've succeeded in getting my retribution on you. She screamed and flung her laptop to the floor. I cut all links with her and concentrated on my own recovery process. I had no regrets for what I had done, any more than she had for what she had done to me. My broken heart was healed by my need for vengeance. Eva texted me one day and asked to get together. She persisted, saying that if I didn't come, I didn't love her, even though I disregarded her message. She finally asked me to come to her office. I could just make out a figure seated in a chair by the window because the room was so poorly lighted. I turned on the light, filling the space with brightness. I could tell as soon as I saw her that her regret had grown more intense. When I asked her why she had called me so suddenly, she pleaded for a chance to make things right and rekindle our love. She also admitted to her transgression. She remarked, I now realize how serious my mistakes were. I understand the consequences of what I did and the suffering I brought upon you. I told her that our relationship was officially finished and gave her the box with her belongings. Your sense of emptiness in my absence will be a continual reminder of the damage you've done and the affection you lost. When I explained to her how serious her acts had become, she was overcome with regret and sadness. She collapsed on her knees, sobbing uncontrollably as the weight of her guilt grew intolerable. She tried to talk to me and work things out for a few months. Sadly, there are no second chances in real life, so Eva had to accept the repercussions of her choices. After some time, Eva was waiting for her car at the valet stand when I saw her and my fiancé leaving a restaurant. I took my girlfriend's hand and turned aside, even though she seemed clearly upset and appeared to be about to approach me when our gazes locked. I was aware after this interaction that I had truly moved on, but that did not mean I was prepared to give Eva another chance to make things right. In response, I'm happy that you moved on, Opus, it's preferable to move on than to remain in one place.